Uh, we will go over some chess games. Hopefully there will be entertaining games. Um, one game is not so entertaining, unfortunately. Uh, we will go over, I believe, because he forces me to do so. Um, <laughs> but hopefully we will learn something from every game. That is our goal, is to learn tonight. This is analyze this and we're gonna learn. Okay, the first one we're gonna go over uh, is from Julian Proleko, is that how you pronounce it, Julian? And uh, Alex Marler. Alex Marler works here at the club, so uh, he should be embarrassed that he lost his game. <laughs> uh, but it was a very good game on Julian's part, and I was pretty impressed. And there are enough <coughs> points in this game that it will be very instructive uh, for those of you who, who are not as good as Julian is. Or even if you are, you'll find it entertaining. I did. There were some really interesting variations. So we're going to go over this game that Julian played. And Julian started off d4, e6. Knight f3, and now Alex played f5, which, as we all know, is a Dutch defense. Not your most popular opening in the world for a good reason. It moves the pawn that's near the king. It's the f pawn. Usually, you want to keep that back in the beginning of a game. Your king could become somewhat exposed. But it's not an easy opening to refute by any means. As a matter of fact, there are a lot of players who play it. You might even argue that. It shouldn't be refuted. People like Hikaru Nakamura, for example, who's a kind of decent player. He's, he's OK. Uh, Gadakomsky, I believe, throws this out from time to time. And he, uh, he's pretty decent, too, I believe. So I'm not going to argue with the, with the opening itself. But it, just to say it's not your standard way of opening a chess game, uh, it's not the most popular. So bishop f4. This move is just a plain developing move, avoiding some of the arguments. Knight out. e3, bishop to e7. So the players are just developing their pieces right now. Bishop to d3, castles. And at some point, we would expect the move c4. Uh, instead, we got this quiet move h3. Now, Julian obviously is playing this move, so he avoids some kind of exchange of his bishop uh, with knight to h5. The knight could have gone to this square and potentially attack the bishop. So I believe that's the reason why h3 was played. It's not exactly um, an aggressive move. It's just to maintain potentially a potentially strong bishop. I don't know that this move is the most accurate, but I think both players are basically in I'm not playing major theory land. I don't want to play book moves. I don't want to be outbooked. I just want to get a position and play chess after that, which is fine. It's a good policy. Uh, and now the move knight e4. I was a bit surprised by this move because it seems early. It seems somewhat premature to play this move uh, so soon. When I look at it, it's not that I can refute it right away. I mean, you shouldn't be moving two pieces in the opening. You should be getting the rest of your pieces out. And when a grandmaster sees a move like this, that's like, I just developed a, I just developed a piece and I'm going to move it again. I'm just going to drop it here for no good reason, uh, which there is no good reason to put the knight there, to be honest. It's just like, maybe I won't let your knight come in the game or something without being able to take it. But that's not a substantial enough reason. So when you see a move like this, the first thing you do is you think, how can I refute this bad move? Like, that's the first thing you think. Like, I would be like, so how do I crush him that he just did this move? <laughs> and it's a bit ambitious, quite honestly, because maybe there's nothing in my position to suggest that I should be crushing my opponent right now. But, be, but the move, you think, you break a principle, it should be destroyed. The move sucks. It is my responsibility as a chess player to prove why you do not break a 100 years, 100 or 150 year old principle of moving the same piece twice in the opening. When I look at it, I don't really see how to refute it. Like, I want to take it and then attack the pawn. Would that be enough of a reason? It looks, you know, not quite right. Like, so like, so like my instinct is, let me say, what if I take this and then play something like knight back? And then he plays d5, and you know, he's got the center, he's solid, and his bishop is not so great, but that's typical of the Dutch. So why did I do this? I gave him my great bishop for this, so that doesn't seem right. My next thought would be something maybe even more aggressive, like maybe g4. <laughs> like, let's go crazy, right? Like, let's undermine that, that horrible piece and maybe take advantage of the open file that I'm going to get on the G file, especially since he offered it to me. I'd feel a little uncomfortable here, to be honest, because I'm not developed myself. My king doesn't exactly have a home. 
I could do this if I were castle, that'd feel really good. If I were castle queenside, that is. But again, I'm like, gee, I, I can't pull that off. I don't know if it's good. I could check with the computer, but. So instinctively, I don't like the move. But there's no way I see to immediately refute it. And maybe it's because black setup is not that great. i uh, sorry, white setup is not really tailor-made to be super aggressive right now. So, all right. So instead, he played simple move, castles. Boring, simple, get your pieces out. But it works. There's a reason why we do these things. They develop pieces, and it works. And now d5. And now we're in a Dutch stone wall, as it's called, a, Dutch, a stone wall very hard to break down this formation, but it has its weaknesses, right? The e5 square is weak because these two pawns, the d pawn and f pawn, have been pushed. So d5 is somewhat permanently weak, but he's banking on this, this juicy knight right here to, to be his friend for life. Now my feeling is, the next move that was played was c4. That's a typical move. My feeling is that I'd be focused on this d5 square a lot, and I might be focused on this knight quite a bit really early. I'd be wanting to play a move like f3 and e4. That's the typical recipe. So maybe I would say tit for tat, now that I've seen d5, I might play knight e5 here. And think about f3 next. I think it makes just reasonable sense. Then I can play for everything I want. I play the same c4, I'll bring this knight out, I'll get everything. That, that would be my recipe. Just to make this piece feel really, really stupid. Like you went there, now you're gonna leave, thanks for the tempo with f3, why are you here? And my pieces didn't do anything really strange. This knight is on a very natural square. So why not? And this might have been the way to, to refute knight e4, actually, is to accept the fact that it's there and then refute it. So you're, so yeah, he just went through a variation like a computer really quickly, <laughs> and none of us understood, except I did catch that he wanted to play c4, which he did. And then, and then bring the knight out from b1 and offer a trade. So, you're, so what he's suggesting, Julian's suggesting, is just plain chess moves, something very regular, which is just classic. But I don't think you refute the move, or you don't really pressure the move with that idea. You just simply play reasonable moves and see what happens next. Which is fine, it's not being super aggressive, but I told you, when Grandmaster sees a move that is unusual, we think, big edge, crush him, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> like, the lights go off, it's red meat. Like, what am I supposed to do? What's wrong with this move, <laughs> right? And how do I refute it? Because it, it so clearly and blatantly breaks a basic principle of development. So to me, 95, with the idea of F3, with the idea of c4, knight, c3, and everything you want happens, and then this knight move simply lost two moves. Because, because he put his knight there, and then he drops the knight back. My point was the knight controlling the e4 square, the knight on d2. So I want to play knight d2 and f3. So I can play e4. So you want to be able to play your knight to d2 and play e4 at some point. The issue here is after c6, knight out, knight here, knight here. The knight on, again, the same issue, the knight on e4, it's not, he can always trade it now. He's not running with his tail between his legs back to f6 and losing, two, and losing just straight two moves. Time is a factor in chess. So this, when you attack the knight now, it can trade itself off and it can claim that it was a smart idea, particularly because this knight on, on uh, d2 might have liked to be on the square e5. Right? So the tempo you're losing is not this dumb knight that's on it, that, that he's losing is not the dumb knight that's on e4. It's because it's, uh, it's being traded off. It's this knight that's shifting over to f6. So I'm not, it's not clear to me that you have refuted this with your idea. It's not a bad idea. It's just that it's not clear to me you've refuted his move with your idea. So I'm asking you to, to put your, grandma, your future grandmaster hat on, Julian, because we know you're headed there. Put on that hat and think, you're like, no, no, I'm not. Like, Come on, dude, get some confidence. You're never going to be a grandmaster? So why are we looking at your game? <laughs> I mean, dude, <laughs> we, I mean, <laughs> right next, <laughs> we don't want to see it anymore. Dude, get some swag. How old are you? 15. 15. And your rating is what? 
1924, I started chess when I was 14 years old. I played in my first tournament when I was 15, ever. First tournament. Thank goodness I didn't have your attitude. Because <laughs> I would not be a grandmaster today. I mean, I recognize that, you know, you're an old man as far as grandmasters are concerned now, since their grandmasters were 12. But with technology, you can hyper accelerate your training. And technology has definitely done so. And if you already have the talent, then there's no reason for you not to think about becoming a pretty strong player one day. Because it, with computers now, with databases, you're still a young guy, you're not you know, an old fart who's like, what's a computer, what is that? You know, you're a kid. So you should be thinking, I, I can get good if you have the talent. And you can maximize that talent with, with databases and, and all that, if you're interested. If you're not, then your attitude is fine and we won't talk about it anymore. I'm sorry? What database do you suggest? What database do I suggest? The one I'm using now, Chessbase. It's excellent. You can dramatically improve your game by going over games. You can get all the GM games. You can get analysis. How much so, does that cost? Uh, I haven't checked lately and actually get it for free. So with my Grandmaster card, that's a joke. <laughs> but I, I do get it for free. There's no Grandmaster card, though. That would be really cool if we had a GM card. But, uh, but I work for the company that does this as well. Not work for them, but I've done videos for them. So they kind of treat me all right. But Chessbase is a really good way, or any database system and any study with computers, you can really improve your game. So we won't deal with, with uh, Julian's self-esteem issues anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, but you got to get that confidence up, dude. You played a great game. That's why I'm going over it, because it was such a good game. But this, I believe, is not the way to try to really refute this line. I think the right way was to play for F3, kill his free tempi that he, that he just donated to you, and then do everything you want. Because you still get all these moves and D4. I'm, get, I'm asking for the whole world, is what I'm asking for. Um, you know, not too much, just, just the whole world. All right? So in this position, he played knight F6. And now you played f3, and he traded. And that night, you might argue it was not justified, the two moves he spent, but he got to trade pieces, which I just, I just wanted to punish him, not just <laughs> trade pieces. That's a not acceptable Very solution. Awesome. All right, so the game now went c5. Now this move deserves punishment. Like, <laughs> this one's like, seriously? Really? You're going to just. Waste Tempe with your knight, and then you're going to waste Tempe with your pawn. We put the pawn on c6, and you're going to break the position open with c5, even though white's better developed, white has all the superior pieces, you're still sitting back there with whatever you got, and now I really feel the need to refute. Like, something bad should happen to him. Really, really bad. He should cry after the next move. <laughs> I really mean cry, too. I know. I'm from Brooklyn. We like to make people cry. So that's what should happen. And uh, you kind of stay chill. I like this move, Rook D1, but I don't like it. I don't feel like it's the cry move. Um, why don't I feel that way? Because I think you allowed him to maybe get away with this trade, potentially. And the structure, even though the file opened here, um, and maybe you'd be able to put some pressure on this square, I feel like now the structure that you wanted, that you achieved in the game, yeah. is not going to happen. Yeah, but I thought this was just uh, really good for me because I'm so far ahead in development and rookie one. And rookie one, and maybe put some pressure here. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right, particularly about this position. I might, I might not argue too much in this position uh, about a superiority. But I get the feeling that there's some kind of, that that was not what black should have been allowed to be able to do. That's just the feeling I get in this position. Particularly if he could trade twice on, maybe, maybe he should take on c4 as well. You know, the more I look at it, maybe I don't argue with your move. Maybe your position is just too good and it's going to play itself. Maybe it's just too good and it's going to play itself. Why not bring a rook to the open file? So I'm not going to argue with you too much. You've got a great position. Black might just kill himself. He's doing a good job of it already. He's played a couple <laughs> of bad moves, and so you know, we'll see what happens. All right, so now black played b6, finally developing another piece. And now you took on d5, which is the move that I would have preferred the first time around. I might have forced that and then play rook d1. 
That was my preference. Okay? So now takes. Now, why do we like white so much? Um, can anybody give a suggestion why we like white so much? Or a rationale why we like white so much in this position? Yes, sir. Anyway. No, I was talking to you. You put your hand up to make to volunteer for him? <laughs> you didn't put it up. That's definitely a good concern. I would also, so development and opening up the game looks reasonable for white. And, and the pieces work together well. Great. Rooks are connected. Bishop and four is good. All the pieces favor white. No question about it. Coordination is there for white. But also a slight structural issue that black faces is black really wishes he could pick this pawn up and put it back here. That would be like a great thing to do right now. Like, Please, could I do that? But now that it's here, he's not really played the Dutch in a harmonious way to keep the integrity of the structure. In the Dutch, if you don't keep the integrity of the structure, you better have a really good reason. But here, his structure looks very loose. And particularly, this deep pawn is starting to look very tenderoni, like something bad's going to happen to it. And it might be essential, and I mean highly essential, for black to close down this file with c4 even though you really like keeping the, the center open, it might be essential for him to shut this file down so that nothing happens on that D file. And then try to work with the, work with, uh, the E file to try to shut down an eventual E4, which is going to happen. Yes? Yeah, white wants to play E4 as fast as he can. But so the question for black is going to be all timing. Like, can he execute a defense against what's going to happen. So in this position, actually, he played, queen c2 was played. The, C, the move c4 wasn't given a chance. Like, I'm not going to give you a chance to play this move. If c4 could happen, c4 and maybe bishop b4 and play for rookie, rookie 8 and try to control the move e4 as much as possible, then maybe black could argue that he could try to hold on. But the way that Julian played the game, I think, was just to the point. We're not going to let you get a chance. And he played queen c2. And after g6, he took on c5 immediately. That's a really big moment. And that, that showed timing. This showed like a, a moment in professionalism. Now the d file is going to really count. It really, truly count. And after takes back, black structure again. We get back to the structure. Looks awful. And uh, white played a great move right now. White took on d5. Beautiful tactical shot. Really nice hit in the face. This is going to prove to you why the rook's on the d file. It's going to prove to you why your structure doesn't count. This is a, a fantastic move. Now, first of all, we all know why queen takes would be mildly silly. Uh, the move of bishop to c4 would pin everything, and we'd go home smiling. Actually had, actually had a tactic like this back in, back in a tournament in Hawaii. Hawaii, that's fine. Yeah, I know. And Hawaii was a really nice place to play. I had a similar tactic to this where I took on d5, and, and the queen couldn't take because of this move. But it was, OK, I'm, I'm just having pleasant memories and I should, <laughs> flashbacks. So, so maybe I'll be able to pull up that game. I'll show you guys the game another time. But I remember a tactic just like this one. Anyway, knight takes d5. And now after knight takes, this great move, bishop to c4. Very simple looking. But that's not the point of the combination, because the pin is there. Bishop e6 seems to cover all the bases, right? Except we can attack that guy again with the move queen b3. e4 wouldn't quite work, all right? e4 looks natural, but it wouldn't quite work because of knight takes on f4, and in fact, you know, we're feeling pretty dumb. So the key move, well, actually, no, e4, I'm sorry, my apologies. e4 takes, 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 and takes. So that's, yeah, so this is fine for black, right? Because rook versus rook, and black has three fat pieces for the material, so it doesn't work out for the queen, right? So. That's not what you want to do. So the key move was this move, queen to b3. And now, 
uh, Knight takes f4 doesn't win the two pieces because black has to give away his knight in this position. And whatever happens next in the corner, now we take the queen and it's a much better situation. Uh, sorry, that's the way bishop takes. And black is getting crushed. All right? Julian wants me to play queen e5 so he can win another pawn to say yes. Actually, no, in that position, yeah, you can play queen d5 check and then pick off more stuff. But so, so in this position, he would have played bishop f6, sorry. And then you take the pawn and whatever. White's, white should have sufficient technique to be able to handle this game. All right? Okay, so queen b3 was a fine move. Of the first, the knight takes d5 was a fine move. The first of a few fine moves that will be played in this game. So queen b3 and now queen to b6, struggling mightily, trying to figure out how to defend the position. And now this next move really showed some class. You know, the class of a potential grandmaster. <laughs> Dude, I'm not going to let you live that down. So in this position, uh, Julian played rook takes d5. Yeah, that's what I said. Whoa. Whoa, whoa. What is that about? And this move is a, is a first class move. Why? Because bishop takes d5, Julian argued, he didn't want to face the move queen takes on b3. In which case, no matter how you capture back with the bishop or the pawn, let's just use the bishop for example, you're going to get double pawns. And your extra pawn is not as sweet as it was. Right, the pawn you won. So this is a really good point. You're up a pawn, but your your structure's been compromised, and you, even if you took with the bishop, uh, if the, took with the pawn, the same thing would happen. So he didn't want to see this happen to his sweet pawn. He just won on d5. So instead, he played the move rook takes. Looks like it might be blowing a rook, but of course, after bishop takes, bishop takes check, and you're hitting the rook to get back your exchange. So if his king moves, for example. Wait, I have a question. Yes, sir. After, uh, after bishop takes rook, uh, in my variation. Sorry, uh, here he played bishop takes, yes. And then king moves, bishop takes. You want me to play bishop takes, bishop check? Yeah. Um, OK. Yeah. Uh, wait, yes, and then the king moves. Yeah. And then he takes the rook. Can queen trade right here as? Yes, but I can take Wait, wait, wait. So his argument is, what if you take the rook now, wouldn't queen takes queen happen? So what do you think white should do instead, just to answer your own question? Exactly. White would first trade himself, and then he'll trade here, and then he'll probably just make a little pawn move. Well, no, he might throw in a check first before playing this pawn move, and then he's got everything under control. The guy's pretty deep, this Julian character for 15 years old who never is going to become a grandmaster. <laughs> so rook takes d5, a first class move, all right? Well thought out and I think uh, you know, pretty good choice. So black decided to play this move rook a8, trying to hold up. Now he's already lost his, his pawn, but black is trying to challenge white. Now that the rook has moved from the corner, black is saying, now I'm going to get the double pawns that I want. Your rook's going to move, I'm going to trade queens, and I get my double pawns, right? Except our non-future grandmaster <laughs> played a pretty grandmasterly move, which was the move rook to d6. No way, the dude said no way, yeah, right? I mean, he's, just, he's lighting up the chessboard with these moves. Incredible, right? For, it's like, bing, sack a knight, boom, make a couple of beautiful moves, sack a rook. Wait a minute, I'm not done. Sack another rook. I mean, it's like exchange is like crazy. This is really, really first class. Um, rook to d6. So what is going on? Let's try to decipher some of this. So if bishop takes, which looks like a reasonable looking move, then we can continue with bishop takes, bishop check, king up, queen takes queen, pawn takes, give me this guy, and now suddenly you have two bishops against, uh, against a rook, 
But maybe this move could win material, except we suddenly have this move. And when you borrow this guy, we borrow that guy. And when he takes him, we can move the king up. So that at least wins a pawn. So you have something else, Mr. Non-Grandmaster? Uh, bishop, so, so now that I'm seeing this line, it really looks like it's, in order not to get double pawns, you have to play like a genius. Which is kind of funny. He's like, I'm avoiding double pawns by playing like a grandmaster, just so that I don't have those double pawns and keep my extra pawn, which is pretty amazing. I'm wondering if there's another solution. I thought about it, and I didn't really see another solution to, to, his, to the genius moves that we saw. It was just look like you had to be a genius, and that was what you did. But maybe now that I'm looking at it, I'm thinking maybe there is a genius solution. Like, for example, what if we accept the fact that we're not that we are going to get double pawns. No, I think actually I can be even more of a genius. I'm going to not get double pawns. That's my goal. I'm going to play the move rook d7 instead. Whoa, I like this guy in the front. He does all the animations and all the sounds. It's great. Let's try this move, rook to d7. Now, Rook with a death wish. You ain't touching my rook, that's for sure. In this case, my rook has no death wish. The other variation of my rook, uh, Julian's rook, did have a slight death wish, and he won a pawn. But I don't want a pawn. I want more. I want <laughs> stuff. And if I get the pawn, I'm going to do it under my terms. Now take a look at this move. The move clears my rook. I'm totally free. You can't touch it because of the pin, right? MC Hammer variation. So <laughs> queen takes queen. Looking to double pawns, I will accept this double pawn moment. Except now I'm attacking your bishop, right? It looks like if you're going to keep this a pawn, you're going to have to undouble my pawns. How else do you keep the a pawn? Right? I'm threatening bishop takes bishop check. If you defend it any way you want to defend it, I'm taking this guy. I mean, I guess you could defend it like this by counterattacking. It's possible. The rook's on the seven. And I get the feeling like maybe I could put this rook. I'm thinking about putting this rook on the seventh, which might be an interesting way to play. And double rooks, I'll make him, I'll make him start suffering now. He's like thinking, trade everything quick, please. Something bad's going to happen. So that looks like an interesting way. Um, maybe that's his only way to play. Because bishop takes on c4, and pawn takes, I like white, like really like white. Like, how do you defend the a pawn? Probably, probably bishop f6 now. Hold on, let's just go one at a time. So, so this one, this one might, may or may not run into the move g5, which is an interesting counter reply. Which case, I'm really curious what happens after rook e7. Rook with a death wish. You didn't say, whoa, dude. So to, keep the, so to keep the sound effects going, that's your job. OK, so this line, though, I'm not clear on after bishop d6, rook takes. And I'm not going to take your rook just yet. Oh. <laughs> just give me a pawn first. <laughs> OK, just attack everything. And now you could play something like mm, this, maybe. And then I'll borrow this guy. Borrowing it as in I'm keeping it. <laughs> and then I have a choice of either playing rook here, which is very passive and defensive and is not very Brooklynite, or rook here, which speaks to Brooklyn very well. And, I'm, and I'm, you can have my pawn. I will have yours. I'll be on the seventh rank. And, and also, I'm threatening this move and collect all your buttons. <laughs> I'm feeling kind of good about this position. Maybe it's not quite winning, but it's a rookie point in game. Very technical grandmaster stuff that Julian's never going to do anyway. So. <laughs> so maybe that's not the right position for him. So that's a line that's interesting. Uh, what other line do we have here? Somebody suggested something that I, that I shushed while I was trying to stay focused. Bishop f6 now? No, no, bishop, bishop takes c4, g5 played, but, but this and this? Now? Yeah. All right, so let's just get this line down. So you're just going after the b2 pawn. 
But poten I'm not worried about g5 because I have bishop d6. I can actually play bishop d6 now. What, what's this about? Okay, I'll get rid of that guy. And I'll take this guy. And I'm ready for the a7 guy too, when you're ready. I'll be up two pawns. I, I, can, I can handle that. <laughs> I'm sure I could handle that. Yeah. All right? So it looks like the rook with the death wish should have been the one without the death wish. Rook, you missed a square. How could you miss a square? You went forward one, and then, you know, he was like sacking stuff. He was in the sack mode. He's like, sack, sack, sack something else. You know. so, so that would have been probably the, the more pristine move in this moment. I wonder if there's better, though. Greed, the greed of grandmasters. We're a very greedy bunch. Good is not good enough. Is there like bishop e5 or something? Bishop e5? Bishop e5. That's sexy. We like sexy. Yeah, cool. <laughs> hold on a second, hold on. What about rook takes f5? Rook with a death wish. <laughs> just rook with a death wish. I like that idea. Rook with a death wish. What is that? That's just stupid, right? What is the deal? We just take it. That looks free. And then we'll take that. Check. And now your king is to dance. You want to go in the corner? Let's not go in the corner, dude. Let's just hang out here for a minute and, uh, and see what happens. This looks like slightly dubious on my part. I calculated all the rules. And you calculated all, so I shouldn't bother. That's what you're telling me. Just don't look. Uh, I'm intrigued, but I don't see any co continuation that is sufficient. So maybe your calculations are correct, sir. Doesn't seem to go anywhere. I want to play bishop e5 check, but unfortunately he has this slight problem of bishop to f6, and then everything is shut down. OK, so what would you say? Unless he went to the corner. If he went in the corner, bishop f6 is still protecting, actually. So it would be fine, oh, okay. unfortunately. <laughs> but it's worth looking at. We look at everything. It's some kind of you know rook. Kamikaze, that's what we call it as a kamikaze. We got the death wish word over there. I like death wish almost better than kamikaze. I remember something about this kamikaze thing. Kamikaze. Uh, no, one of my students once called, oh, she once called a sacrifice a kamikaze. Move. Like the rook, you know, like it, it's kamikaze. Or sa she, it was like sacrificing the rook. No, it was losing the rook. That's what it was. It was a blunder of a rook. He said, oh, no, your rook went kamikaze. And I was like, man, you're insulting a kamikaze. Like, like when, you're, when you have a kamikaze, a true kamikaze, you take people out with you. <laughs> right? Other people should be dying. In fact, more than you. When you blunder, it's a blunder. <laughs> call it what it is. <laughs> Don't dress it up and call it a kamikaze. Because you should be winning stuff when that happens, OK? So she was like, oh, OK, calm down, mister. It's like, yes, thank you. So, so you should be proud of your kamikaze rooks, is what I'm telling you. All right, so rook d7, uh, hold on. Rook d7, I'm really proud of. That's, that's like, a, that's like mm, right? That's, that looks like an improvement. Of course, the computer will say, no, it's not. There's a better move. But anyway, rook d7 looks pretty cool. So instead, rook d6. And I think that line I showed where you just lead to that extra pawn, and it's a rook, technical rook and pawn ending, is the kind of line you'd like to avoid, Julian. So that's why I'm, I'm suggesting something that it felt like there was more spice to your position than that position. Uh, what happened after bishop e5 instead of rook? Oh, so you want to play bishop e5 instead in this moment, because that's how you roll with your, with your pieces, just hanging out there. That rook is just <laughs> there. I think it's just bishop f6, no? No. Uh, yeah. I think it leads. Yeah. I think black is just going to go into some random rook and pawn ending again, at, at best for you. Yeah. I don't see a genius move here. Genius. Yeah, I uh, see actually, no. Actually, uh, queen takes b6. OK. Uh, queen takes. Mm-hmm. Mm, I don't 
don't know. This line seems. Maybe I can take on F6 and take on B6. If you get a triple chance, yeah. It's a, it's another one of those endings, though. Maybe this is a bit better for you as well. Yeah, yeah. I can buy that if if you get there. Um, he could also play against your A pawn or just defend, maybe. And you're, trust me, dude, this is, I would love this against any GM in the world. I'm not sure I would always win it, but it's going to be some work for you to pull off this endgame. It's definitely plus over minus for white, at least. But again, it's not like that's, it's not that same, it's not that same plus. Over. The other line was like, oh, we're going to have an early dinner tonight. <laughs> this feels like, oh man, why didn't I eat a little bit more before the game? You know, I'm gonna be taking some time trying to figure out the technique. Maybe if I play Komsky, it's gonna be a draw. You know, that, I don't like those. I, you wanna work harder for those edges, which is why I say you punish people when they make a mistake. You look, how do I punish this? What's the principled way? All right, so instead of that happening, uh, Rook d6, pretty spectacular looking move. Response was queen takes. And counterintuitive, this bishop takes bishop check, which is the correct move. At all costs, he's trying to avoid those double pawns, which is um, OK. So queen takes, rook takes. White is up a pawn, threatening potentially to sacrifice here. Again, the same rook e7 idea. So black played bishop to f6, rook takes, and rook takes. This is one of those positions I would not be thoroughly confident that the win is in hand. It's going to happen sometime soon. Uh, white has to be accurate again. And you're going to see what happens when a small inaccuracy. So far, well played. Not perfect moves by Julian, but certainly well played. Feels like a master level type performance so far. And then he's going to make a small mistake, and Black's going to be back in the game. And this is where it happens. <coughs> B3, solid move. Maybe Rook F2 was more accurate. Maybe even rook c1 was more accurate. It's about time he should be aggressive. Instead, he allowed this key move. Now, this is a star move. This is a great move, maybe the only great move black played so far this game. Uh, but truly an excellent move. Fight for the open file. At all costs, stay active. Just fight for the open file. And this complicates matters. Rook d2 is threatened. So now the move, rook f2, and now g5. Another great move. We saw this line before. And now bishop c7. So one great move, second great move, followed by a dud, unfortunately. Now the correct move here was perfect and would have shown the imperfections of white's play. And what really shown it up is to play the move rook to d3. Stay on the file, keep the counterplay alive, and have a great position. And now. The only way to really defend this pawn is rook e2. I guess everybody sees why e4 is a small mistake. Slightly difficult, unfortunate choice. If you haven't seen why, you'll just take a little gander at that move, all right? So anyway, we, we like avoiding those kind of mistakes. Unfortunately for white in this moment, rook e2 leads to a very dramatic shot. Who can tell me without looking at the notation over there? Don't, don't look over at the notation. Rook takes e3. Are you back with the rook in the death wish? Yeah. Proudly so, black sir. Rook black rook now has a death wish. Rook takes e3. Beautiful move. And after rook takes, bishop to d4. Only way to defend, f4. And the whole game changed. Isn't that nasty? Chess sucks, man. Chess really sucks. After all that work to have two simple two-move combination, three-move combination, and your and your all that beautiful moves and just flipped upside down. Why do we play this game? So we have a death wish. That's what it is. Yes, Julian. Instead of rookie two, can I play a four? Against. Oh, before this all happened. Yeah. You mean instead of, instead of this move, you want to play f4 in this moment? Yeah. 
That's an interesting choice. So you want to take there, and if I play bishop d4, you get what? You run with your, what if, okay, we'll do that. I'll take, you'll take, and now I'll play this move. You better watch yourself. Just be very careful what your next move is. <laughs> King where? King F1. I don't know what you're going to do about this little guy hitting your rook and your bishop. <laughs> that wasn't really kind. So I'm threatening not just a discovery to get after this guy, I'm threatening a discovery to get after this guy. Black's pieces are perfectly harmonized, even though there's two of them. And there's tactical issues. I mean, king moving, let's say, actually you can't even, actually the main threat is your bishop. I was thinking the main threat was on your king. Oh, the, the, main threat is rookie. the main threat is rookie seven. Oh, okay. That's the main threat right now. And there's no way to really avoid it. If you move your rook, let's say takes, then obviously, uh, rook here check or rook e5 gets the job done so thanks for your rook I, don't, I think black's just winning now no? huh there's no okay whatever floats your boat <laughs> we're winning your rook in that line right this looks winning for black activity activity you gave his rook a chance to get in and then suddenly you have very limited number of moves. Black's going to win his pawn back in the main line. So rook d3. Okay, this, is, this, this one here, I'm, I'm sure Marler will be kicking himself for missing rook d3. So make sure you tell him about it. <laughs> that's, that's how we do it, never these parts. <coughs> huh? Never, ever, ever. No. Well, you got to make sure you tell him. Like, Marler, did you know you could have easily equalized? Because, you know, we chess players, then we can't even sleep that night. So it's like, why did I need to know that? It would have been better to know I was just lost. Instead, he played this move very passive. And uh, that changed the complexion of the game a lot because now white got away with what he got away with. And now after this move, he played c4, trading off these pawns. Um, I have to say, yeah, so obviously this is a very important moment because this move does not work, why? Or causes more problems for white than it's worth because of what? Anybody? Yeah. Pretty unfortunate to have to suffer against this pawn and then you have to figure out how the heck you're going to deal with this. You might have to bring your king up. Maybe you can put your bishop here and eyeball this pawn. I mean, it's not the end of the world, because this plan followed by this, this, this is some kind of plan, but it's so much work. Like, why, why would you go through that nonsense when you can just destroy this little creature here? Takes and rook d2. Now white is the one with the file. White is active, and it's, it's us white for choice here. And bishop back was another unfortunate choice that the, our non-future grandmaster found a really great move. Another excellent bit of tactics. See if you guys can pick up this move. It's, it, it actually confused me at first. I was like, what? And then I was like, oh, nice. And it's not obvious why at first either. Well, I guess it is obvious. Okay. <laughs> Bishop to c5. Really nice move. The point of the move is that if you just take the bishop directly, he grabs with check, and he plays another check and picks off whichever pawn, you know, the a pawn is gone, and eyes up two pawns. Much easier win. So, if you, so that means you can't take his bishop, but he's going to take your a pawn. And if you defend your a pawn, then you run into another nasty line. He's exchanged it off. Now he plays rook to d5. And you've given him somebody. And if you try to defend that somebody, then he gladly trades. And there's a bigger somebody who's coming. And if you try to run yours, oh, sorry. I'm no, no, he's promoting with check first, sir. 
It would have been better if you had kept your mouth shut right at that moment, right there. <laughs> but, I mean, look at this masterpiece of calculation, though. Like, just in time, everything just fits perfectly. His king is inside the box. Your king is outside the box. So that means this king will not catch this pawn. For those of you who don't know what the box is, does everybody know what the box is? Not everybody? You're not sure? The box means that the king, just humor me a moment before I explain to the uh, other players, that this, this, if you draw a diagonal with this pawn and create a box, which is a four by four square, if the king can step inside the square, then it will catch the pawn. So any chase like this happens, he catches the pawn. On the other hand, if you draw this box, this five by five box, this king cannot enter the box, therefore after king here, pawn up, he simply is not gonna catch the pawn. And that's gonna be it. So the idea of a box is important in chess. You can just glance and see the box and you just know. You're not catching my pawn, I'm catching yours. So that's the, that was the perfection of this deep calculation here. Rook d5, rook c5, takes, takes, a4. White's already inside the box in this position because this pawn to the diagonal actually touches the king, so the king is standing inside the box, while black is already outside the box, so white's winning. And that's it. All right? So <coughs> bishop to c5, and after bishop c7, bishop takes on a7, and the game is over. Two extra pawns. Uh, oh, he played bishop g3 hoping for a small little oversight on this <laughs> part. Not likely. <laughs> eh, sorry, not gonna happen. So king of one, and uh, now we see the non-grandmasterly gra non technique at work as he just proceeds to win the game. Bishop d4, king of seven. Bringing the king toward the center, of course, in the end game, extremely important. Very tight unit of pieces that white has. And rook c2 offering a trade. You're up two pawns. You happily trade off pieces. Black doesn't want to trade. White's king gets to an even more dominant position. h5 wriggling around. a4 trying to score a touchdown. f4, e4. And now two pass pawns are on the board for white. So more black does, the worse it gets, basically. So the bishop tries to help out, offering yet another trade. And the game is a lot easier here. King to b3, rook behind pass pawn, and push, and push, and push. Now king, time to go, and that other pass pawn starts to count as well. Never should have played f4, by the way. That just helped the position, but we won't beat a dead horse too much. And after king here, now the king and pawn are enough. They're just going to dominate the rook, and the game is over. So give Julian a hand for a really fantastic performance. That was really well done. Couple of mistakes in the game as to be expected. You know, since he's not gonna become a grandmaster, he should be making mistakes. <laughs> but that, that was very impressive, a fine effort. I mean, not many moves to improve on in that game. So you should be proud of that game. Mm -hmm.